voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am. The congregation is now deaf. All right. Good morning, church family. M Merry Christmas. Merry day after Christmas. What day of Christmas is this? Anybody know? 13th? Boxing All right. Day. I love it. Boxing day. Boxing day. That's right. All right. In the UK. Wonderful. If y'all would, let's stand as we begin. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of my praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the Fixed upon it, mount of thy meeting. Oh, to grace, oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. 
Thank y'all so much for joining us the day after Christmas. So great to see all of y'all. We hope each and every one of you had a very special day, a wonderful time with family, friends. I know I ate too much food, but uh, <laughs> that uh, seems to be a pattern here during the holidays, but I'm going to keep working on it. But uh, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. Uh, if you would, head to the comment section if you're on Facebook or head to attendmcoc.org. We want to know that you are with us virtually. Uh, and also, if you're here in-house, you can also go to attendmcoc.org for our digital attendance card. There are also attendance cards in the backs of the seat pockets. And uh, uh, we also want to know how we can be praying for you. So you'll see a spot to let us know about your prayer requests. We as a staff and the shepherds, we get together every week to pray over this, and we want to know how we can be praying for you. So right now we're going to continue on. I think you'll know this song and love this one. This is one of my favorites. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone. Most holy Lord, with all of my heart, all of my heart I sing praise. coming to this communion, you all know a lot of people refer to it as the Last Supper. Well, the word Last Supper is now found in Scripture. The word Passover meal is. But the Hebrews call it cedar, S-E-D-E-R. The word cedar means order. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Lord says, Jesus is our Passover. Now, you may not be well aware of 
that pas Passover meal, what's the food content? So it's, they sit down to eat at this Passover meal. Obviously, as you read in the Old Testament, there's lamb. I forgot my communion cup. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, I got it now. You got the lamb, the bread, a hard-boiled egg, vegetable, a bit of herb, sweet paste. Now, can you imagine this with me? If the Lord particularly set aside the lamb as a part of our communion, you would look at this cup and said, hey, I got a lamb to partake of every time we partook of it. Really, right? It never happened that way. Why? There was a reason Jesus did not pick the lamb to be a part of our weekly thing. He chose the bread. Why did he choose the bread? In the Hebrew concept of the Passover meal, there were three pieces of bread. They call it the matzo. The first bread is put in a bag called an ekad, never to see it again. The second piece, the most important piece that Jesus held, he broke it in half, as tradition goes. He puts one in a bag. The other half, he wraps it in cloth. The third piece is the actual piece that he handed to the disciples and says, pass it among you and eat. But in that second piece, Jesus particularly had something with that piece. He said, take, eat. This is broken for you. That it resembles his body. The other half that was wrapped in cloth resembled his burial being wrapped in cloth. And the matzo, that bread, had to be prepared a certain way. Three ways, most important way. It had to be unleavened. Leaven meaning sin in scripture. The body of Christ had no sin. Number two, it had to have, it had, that bread had to be striped, which means it represents Isaiah chapter 53. With his stripes, we are healed, his wounds. And the last piece of that bread, it had to be pierced. Of course, you and I already know he was nailed to the cross. So, as you take out your wafer, Remember what Jesus says. When you take this, you take this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this bread is a remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We don't take it lightly because we should reflect the price he paid for the penalty of our sins. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the same way, in that table, there was the wine. If you're not familiar with Passover meal, there were four cups of wine. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. The second cup is called the cup of judgment. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. And the last cup, the fourth cup, is called the cup of praise. If you remember in the book of John, after the supper, they sang. That was the fourth cup of praise. But in actually, in that table, Jesus raised two cups. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. To his disciples, he made a promise. He said, the next time I drink this, new with you will be in the kingdom. It's a promise, not only to them, but folks, it's a promise to us. He also raised the third cup, the cup of redemption. He said, this is my blood, which signifies the new covenant, a new covenant I give you. What is that covenant? That covenant is forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In him, we find true forgiveness of the heart.
I'm going to make you guys look at God this morning intimately. Before you partake of this cup, I don't want you just taking it ritually. I want you to look at his eyes. Why? If you partake of this cup with any unconfessed sin or your conscience bearing the sin that you have not repented of, you are taking this cup unworthily. You are not worthy to take the cup. That's why Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 11 that those who take it on word we bring judgments to themselves. I want you to be honest with God. Look at your heart. Is your conscience pricking you? That's God saying, repent, turn around, confess to me that sin. Your confession is no good without repentance. You have to repent before you confess. When you break open that seal, that means you're telling God, I honestly am truthful with you, Lord. My conscience is cleared. Because if it's not, the more you go on in your sin, the more your heart is hardened. And Paul calls it in the New Testament, a seared conscience, where God, God cannot prick you anymore. Examine yourself. As I pray for the cup, examine yourself before God. Repent of your sin. Turn around. And confess your sin to him. That you be worthy to take of this cup. Let's pray. Father in heaven. Hundreds of people here this morning. But I am so proud that you, the all-knowing God, knows every single heart, mind, and soul. And your loving arms extends to all of us and says, come to me. Tell me about it. What do you have going on? I want to hear. And I ask for their sake and mine that we bear ourselves open before we open this cup. And we may be worthy of you to take of it as a reminder of the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. As an extension on our reflections on the Lord's Supper, I hope you'll join me in reflecting on the words of this next song. Yes. 
now that you have your conscience clear, it's time for God to prick you regarding what you would give to him. You got to remember, God gave us the greatest gift the world can ever receive. For God so loved the world. What did he give? His only son. Yesterday, we unwrapped a lot of presents. Many of us did. But God says, what present do you have for me? Is it deeply hidden inside your pocket, pocketbook, your purse, wherever? It's kind of like a test, guys. Kind of like a test. He owns it anyway. He's just wanting to see if you're willing to dig down and let go. Because the more you hang on to it, your conscience will start getting guilty. And remember, guilt is good in itself because it produces response. The response is repent. Let's turn around. Let's give to God what's already his anyway. That's what he's asking today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you really don't need the funds that comes out of our pocketbooks or our pocket or whatever. Because you, the great God who owns the entire universe and everything in it, can provide for any of your own. And you made that promise anyway. But this little exercise that you give us in this worship service is actually a representation of a kind of heart that we possess. Is it a heart dedicated to you? Is it a heart loyal to you? Is it a heart that you can mold, that you can teach, that you can comfort, that you can whisper the sweet sound of heaven? And Father, that's your aim. And it starts with, with a lot of people that has a tight grip on their finances. Father, I ask for your spirit to help them loosen up their grip that they may offer that to you which you would gladly accept in Jesus' name. Amen. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk the long dusty road and the hill to the cross. Church, you are the one that we pray. 
It is so good to be with you the day after Christmas. I mean, I, maybe some of you don't have this experience, but I know a lot of people have the experience of as you're kind of approaching Christmas, it gets busier and busier. And you got all these things you got to do and, and all, all this and kind of builds and builds. And sometimes I think because of that, uh, we just kind of, there's this big, whew, once it's done. And in all honesty, I, I mean, I, I will have to confess, it would be nice if I didn't have to preach the day after Christmas. <laughs> Because I, I couldn't really say Phew, until after we're done. But yet there also is a sense in which all week long taking time to prepare and to be working in the Gospel of John with uh, John's prologue and then up early this morning and working with that, I'm very, very grateful. And I hope that some of what we say today will be helpful to you because I think one of the things we need to understand is that Christmas, this story of the incarnation of Christ, is not something you're supposed to kind of think about really intensely for a few days and then whoosh, be done. Instead, the incarnation is the doorway into the life and death and resurrection and the ascension and the reign of Jesus Christ. You can't just leave it behind like the wrapping paper off the gifts. Instead, there's something far more profound that's being brought into our lives and offered to us. And I, I just think that's really important. And I think we need to understand that Scripture itself is God's revelation to us. It invites us to know God, to have a relationship with God that's deep and rich and meaningful, that we're a lifetime developing and maturing. I, I said, it's something that bothers me. I think some people kind of get stuck. They kind of have a, a certain phase where they're pretty fired up about Jesus, and then after that, well, they just kind of, that's the memory. Instead of it being this uh, growing, dynamic, enriching, deepening reality in the presence of the Lord Jesus, who is our friend. He invites us to be not only his disciple, he does invite us to be that. But when you read in John, one of the things he talks about is he talks to his disciples and says, I, I'm not going to no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And so even what he's teaching us to, to change in our lives is to prepare us to enjoy a friendship with him. Without those changes, I could never enjoy that friendship with him. I'd always feel awkward, embarrassed, and all that kind of stuff. But instead, he is creating a place in me that is able to really enjoy him fully. And he's doing that because he plans to bring me into the very presence of his father so that I might enjoy being a part of all that. So I, I think we need to remember that Scripture constantly is there as an invitation not only to study it, to hear it, to memorize it, but also to meditate on it, to be drawn deeper. And what I find, I don't know about you, but what I find, even at 68, I find every time I start to work with a passage of Scripture, I go, how did I miss that? 
Why have I not seen that? Why didn't I see that connection? You got this here. Oh, I, there's that connection way over there. Or, or this is, oh, wow, look at. I, th- I think some people, you know, it's, it we're almost first of the year, and so some of you would be starting that uh, year through the Bible thing, you know. And, you know, you, you, you start out pretty good as long as you're in Genesis and, and maybe in the gospel, all that kind of stuff. And then you, you, after a while, you kind of, it kind of, it's hard to keep up, and then you get way behind, and then you get discouraged. I think the more God's Spirit begins to work in your heart, the more you go, oh, my goodness, I'd never seen this before. That's exciting. Now, one of the things I do want to say is I know some of you go, well, you know, Russ is really hard to take notes on. It's, he's kind of hard to follow. So I've talked to Todd. And one of the things we're going to be doing uh, is on Mondays, I'm planning to post uh, online on our, on our website. So Todd will explain to me exactly where some of the key notes that I've used in preparing so that it'll you know, have the passages, other kinds of things. And that way, if you want to go deeper, you can go back to that and kind of click on that. It would open up in a Word document or maybe a page document. I'm not sure how it will show up, but it will show up. And that way you can kind of work. So today, what I'm inviting you to do is listen. Work with Scripture, listen. Because to me, I always want the text to be guiding our thinking. A lot of preachers, what they want is their outline to be guiding your thinking. And I got that, and that's important. But I really want preaching to be immersed in the text. That's my desire. And so this morning, what we're going to do is look at uh, how John begins his gospel. Now, the gospels, all four of the gospels tell the story of Jesus, right? And so when you're telling a story, Walt and Anthony and some others write stories. And so it's really important how you get a story started. You know, a lot of us growing up, we heard the kind of the famous storyline, once upon a time. And I think uh, J.R.R. Tolkien begins The Hobbit with once it was a hole. A hobbit hole. And then he describes how hobbit holes are not like other holes in the ground that you might find. So writers try to create a way of beginning with you. You look at the Gospel of Mark, and man, Jesus is already a full-grown man. It's the baptism of John, and, and John is eager to get right into the heart of the story. And so his thing moves at a fast clip in the Gospel of Mark. Matthew and Luke kind of slow things down some. Matthew decides the best way to begin a story is... Because he, his mind, his Hebrew mind, is with genealogy. You look in Genesis, a lot of genealogies there. And he's rooting this birth of the Messiah. So he's going to talk about the birth. He's rooting the birth of the Messiah in promises, covenant promises God made to especially David and Abraham. And he's showing you the flow of the history of Israel that, that comes out of these promises that God made in creating relationships with people. Luke spends a lot of time talking about the Holy Spirit's role in not only the conception of Jesus, but also the the preparing in the birth of John, all that. And so that's the way Luke starts out with, and, and his gospel is so full of joy and light. It's just very exciting. But you get to the gospel of John, and what you find, I think, is this. John has spent years meditating on what does this all mean? If you think you can just kind of read through the Gospel of John and go, I got got that, you are not understanding what John is doing in those first 18 verses of his Gospel. He's inviting the reader into this. He's going to develop those things throughout his Gospel. As you read through the Gospel of John, you ought to be going, oh, man, he talked about that. He introduced me that in the prologue. So what I want us to do is first listen to the prologue, and then I want to talk about some kind of key things. But my hope is this, number one, that during this week you would spend some time with those first 18 verses of John chapter 1. For some of you who are industrious, I would encourage you to memorize it. There are very few passages of Scripture that would more benefit you as a follower of Jesus in those first 18 verses of the Gospel of John, because they're fairly familiar, they're not that hard to memorize. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. 
And that life is the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. Now, he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, because the true light that gives light was shining in the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word was made flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Father, uh, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now, John testified concerning Him. He cried out saying, this is the one I talked about, spoke about, when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He goes on and he says, uh, out of his fullness we have all received grace and place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So let's just talk, first of all, I want to talk about there is the wonder of the incarnation that John talks about. And then what I want to look at is there's this startling invitation that is made in this prologue of the Gospel of John where you have to make a decision, will I receive what's being given or will I just kind of do things on my own? So let's look at that just briefly. So first of all, I want to look at this, this wonder of the incarnation. So when John begins his Gospel... He begins with the beginning. He takes this, he, the reference there, that there ought to be in your mind when you hear that in the beginning was the word, where should your mind automatically go? Anybody know that? Where? Genesis chapter 1. And really the entire chapter. Because in that entire chapter, what you find is God is creating. He's bringing things into order by his word. And so John is taking the, the, the Greek term there is logos, but it was the way that uh, if you're uh, translating from the Hebrew, the, the word that would be in Hebrew, that it was one for the Greek reader, logos would be understood as the word, also as reason or the divine ordering principle, all that. But what John is doing in the prologue is he's saying that this divine word was there in the beginning, and he's saying, and this word was not just a word that God spoke. This word was God. That's startling. Now, if, you're, if your mind is not startled by that, you're not really paying attention to what John is, is trying to teach us. It is very difficult for a lot of people in our world to think about Jesus as the Son of God in the sense of implying and understanding full deity of the Son. But that's what, what John is telling us is before all time, before all space was created, the Father and the Son were together. God was not lonely. He didn't just go, well, I'm just so lonely. I got to create some people. Instead, Father and the Son together. And theologically, I know C.S. Lewis was one of the first people I ever read about this. Theologically, what, what a lot of theologians talk about is this, that the relationship between the Father and the Son is so intense and so real that it is the third person. It is the Holy Spirit. And so you have Father and Son and the Holy Spirit always in relationship with one another, always enjoying one another. And that's the kind of reality that the reader is invited to begin to think about. Now, that's hard to think about. But John loves to think about it. He loves to talk loves to think about the father-son relationship, and he loves to talk about 
the work of the Spirit. And so he talks about in the beginning was, right? And then you find that this word became flesh. So what always was now becomes something that is different. The word who is always with the Father now enters into the flow of human history. This is startling. And if, you, if your mind is not, is not turned upside down when you begin to think about this, you're not really thinking about it. You're thinking just language itself. So you got the language down, but you're not really allowing yourself to see the utter astonishing reality of the Word becoming flesh to dwell among us. And John's going to make a lot about this. Later on, he's going to talk about how Jesus is the way and the truth and the light. That's what he's quoting Jesus saying. He, basically, what he says is, anyone who knows me knows my Father. He's going to explore this reality. The Word became flesh. And, and, and the idea of dwelling among us is, the, the term there really is what was used to translate the, the Hebrew term for tabernacle. It's that, that the word tabernacled among us. And then you see this Jesus word tabernacled among us that he's full of, he, he, he reveals the glory. The glory was on him. He, he's full of grace and truth. So in, in, when you read the Old Testament, once again, this is one of those things you kind of go, oh my gosh, I've not seen that. So when the tabernacle is constructed according to God's design, what happens? When the tabernacle is first set up, it is the glory to God that descends on the tabernacle because there's where heaven and earth are meeting. When Solomon constructs the temple of David, what happens? The glory of God comes down and fills the temple because that's where heaven and earth are meeting. And so you find in John's prologue, the word that always was God now becomes flesh and, and you see the glory of God in him. And he's full of grace and truth. And, and John says, and we witness that. He goes, that's what we were seeing all the time. That's what. And then he goes on just a little bit later in verse 18. He says, no one has ever seen God. But the one and only son who is himself God. And is in closest relationship with the father. Has made him known. You talk about a deep love for you and for me. You see this, this baby who became flesh, and so we're familiar with the story from Luke and Matthew, is born into a dangerous world and exposed to the suffering of this world. It is God's love that is dealing with our broken relationship. That's part of We go back now into the prologue, and part of what it says is, in him was life. And the word there is Zoe. It's a spiritual life. He's not talking about biological life. He's talking about the spiritual life. In him was life, and that life was the light of the world. And he's talking about how the, world, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. But let me just say this. A little later on, he makes it clear. The darkness does not want to receive it. So what I find interesting is that there is now, in, in the Gospel of John, very early, there already is this invitation for you and for me to do something about this word, this life, this light, this one who is dwelling among us and revealing the Father. It's not just an abstract theological idea. There is, in this reality of Jesus coming to be with us, there is an invitation, and every one of you has to decide what you're really going to do with that invitation. Because he says this light is in the world. And what he says is, although he made the world, the word, word made the world, the word is this light. It's life. The word comes in and it speaks and addresses. So the word itself, just like in creation, is separating light from darkness. You see that once again in Genesis 1. Separating light from darkness. And he says this, this light was in the world. The world that he created with the Father. And it says, the world he created did not recognize him. You know, one of the great paradoxes, I think, is that 
few hundred years ago began the philosophical movement called the Enlightenment. That's where everybody was supposed to be enlightened. There was this, the light of reason that was now coming on people, the light of the logos. But what was meant by the Enlightenment was very different than what John means. Because the starting point for the Enlightenment was human reason. It was an attempt to try to get rid of what they called superstition, God's revelation, and say, we really are the makers of ourselves. And we can figure out what all this is about because we're smart enough, we're bright enough, we've got, we're really intelligent people. And we're going to figure out how to do this without reference to God. That basically was the thrust of so many in the Enlightenment. And look at the darkness that came into the world through that doorway of claiming to be a light because it refused to see the light that was among us before this movement called the Enlightenment. And we're reaping the whirlwind of where those leaders in Enlightenment said we ought to go because we ought to just build our own towers of Babel. We'll we'll define what good and evil is. We'll do it on our terms. It's just a repeating of the fall story in in Genesis chapter 3. And John says, when Jesus came into the world as light, the world didn't recognize him. And we see in the enlightenment, when Jesus shows up as light, the world doesn't receive him. And even today, when Jesus comes as light, there are many people who go, well, that's just unenlightened. It says, he came to that which was his own. Now, that's really something we need to be paying attention to because my guess is most people in this room going, well, I'm his. He's got me. Really, does he? I mean, that's one of the things I have to be honest about. It's easy to claim that. But what he says, what John says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now, that's what I want to talk about as we kind of move toward the end is what it is to receive Jesus. Because when you think about it, if you're not careful, you're going to substitute what you mean by receiving Jesus before with what John means when he says, talks about receiving Jesus and what Jesus talks about when he describes what it is to receive him. So we're, we're post-Christmas, right? I want you to think about the gifts that you received yesterday and the gifts you received over the years. How's that work? Now, for some of us, you know, you, know you, you get that gift that, especially when you're a child, you're really, you're so excited. You got the thing you wanted. You spent a few days with it, all excited. And then after a while, you're just kind of, well, bored. I talked to one of the children today, and she, and she explained to me she's got a jumpy house. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of jumping in that household. But the day will come when that jumpy house, well, I kind of outgrown that. And, eh, you know. My guess is every one of you had those gifts that you were so excited about. And then after just a little while, the shirt went out of style. The thing you had that was such so fascinating, you lost interest or the next version came out. But let's be honest. Some of you, even yesterday, opened the gift. You looked at it. You gave that little smile. Oh, I love this. This is, ooh, this is so, I'm so glad. And inside your head, you know what's going on. I wonder if I can exchange this. I always save my receipts. And when Jackie opens up, I go, look, honey, if you don't like it, I got the receipt. And she reminded me yesterday that the earrings I'd gotten her looked an awful lot like the earrings I got her last year. And so I went out to the car, I got the receipt. Well, that's the way a lot of us receive. It's on our terms. The word that John is using is a word of hospitality. And in that word of hospitality, what it meant was that you receive people into your home as an honored guest. And you turn things over. Everything now centered around, focused around them. And everything that you were doing was making sure that they were honored and they were pleased. That's the word being used. It's the word Matthew uses when after he is about to put Mary away, the betrothed, and he finds out she's pregnant. He doesn't understand it. The angel appears to him and says, this is by the power of the spirit. And what it says is Matthew took her home with him. I mean, Joseph. Yeah. Joseph. Thank you. Joseph took him home. I'm great. I made that mistake on purpose. Just see if anybody was listening. (laughs) 
Sean got it. Uh, I, I got a reward for you afterwards, Sean. So Joseph took her home with him. It means Joseph received her. He brought her in with him. And he now was forming his life around her and the child he was bringing into the world. That's what receive is about. You know, I have a friend who just recently, uh, with Christmas, uh, was with the, he and his wife with the, 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 one of the sons and that son's wife. And so, you know, they, you, know you get that kind of exchange of gifts and all that. So this box, according to my friend, there was a box. And my friend opened the box. He opened the box, and, and he and his wife looked into it, and there were two little shoes. And they kind of got quiet. And then when you lifted up the two little shoes, there's a little photo of um, a little sonogram. And, and you can see a little baby that will be born sometime in the near future. Now, how do you think that husband and wife received that gift? Do you, th- do you go, well, we're going to outgrow this? Do you think they go, well, can we return this? No. They already, even before this child is born, they are eager to receive this gift into their lives. Their lives will never be the same. I watch a lot of grandparents, and a lot of times the grandparents are a lot more excited about the birth of that grandchild than they were about their own child. Because they recognize that baby's not going to be waking me up late at night. I get to hold that baby when I want to. That's what it is to receive Jesus. It's not receiving him on my terms. It's receiving him as the precious one that he really is. The birth of that baby was different from any other birth ever. That's what John's prologue is pointing to. And John is inviting us, even his people, to recognize him and to receive him into our lives. You know, I remember in my first marriage, I remember going to my in-laws pretty soon after we got married. And, uh, oh, the, you know, they, they assured me uh, how much I was just like their son. And just, you know, they were just so glad to have me in their home. And I kind of, I believe that. And that was working pretty well until somebody came over to visit us. They, they had a youth minister who was a friend of mine. I knew him. And he came over to see the family. He came over, and the, and the TV was on. We're all sitting there in the living room. The TV's on, and it's kind of loud and all that kind of stuff. And he's talking, and I'm trying to pay attention. And, and Jack would tell you, I don't do well with music playing and trying to study. I don't do well. There's a conversation. I want to turn the radio off, the TV off. I want to listen. So all this was on. And so while he is talking, I just got up, and I went over, and I turned the TV down. So you couldn't hear it anymore. Well, after that guest left, the skeptic was assured that, whoa, you're just like one of us. I got the not-so-private rebuke. I'm the hostess here, and you don't touch the TV without asking me if you can change it. Now, that made pretty clear my status. But that's the way a lot of us treat Jesus. We receive him. We talk about him. We say the right things about him. Oh, you're mine. Oh, oh, yeah. But there are things that he is not supposed to touch without our permission. He He starts meddling with that, and our response is not good. When we treat Jesus that way, we're not understanding what John is talking about in these first 18 verses and what he's elaborating in the story that follows. I think one of the things we need to understand is that my receiving, your receiving, our receiving Jesus, number one, is not just on our own terms, but also it is a daily receiving the presence of Jesus Christ in my life, whether you're at school, on the athletic field, whether you're at work, you're in retirement, in a conversation with somebody who just cut you off and actually dinged your car, and now you're really... He wants to be with us in our daily lives. I remember Dallas Willard 
talking about uh, Frank Lawbaugh, who uh, wrote a little book called The Game of Minutes, and part of what this man was doing and was very successful at it, apparently, according to Dallas Willard, is he, the book's called The Game of Minutes, and his desire was every minute through the day to at least one second be thinking of Jesus as present. And that kind of became a spiritual practice. Constantly thinking of Jesus throughout the day, throughout the minutes of the day. And Willard used a poem that I like. I memorized it, but I'm not going to try to quote it because you saw earlier. Sometimes when I try to quote, I get a little bit confused. So there's this, there's this poem called the, the Opening Door. I'll just share it with you. It says, and I try to use this every day of my life, kind of the beginning in the mornings, but it says, along with reading scripture, spending some time in prayer. But this this poem reminds me, it says, Enter, Lord Christ, I have joy in your coming. You have given me life, and I welcome your coming. I turn now to face you, I lift up my eyes. Be blessing my face, Lord Jesus, be blessing my eyes. May all I look on be blessed and be bright. My neighbors and my loved ones be blessed in your sight. You have given me life. And I welcome your coming. Be with me, Lord. I have joy. I have joy in my life with you. See, what what that leads us to be thinking about is, will I open this door of my heart, this open this door of my mind, to open this door of the activities of my day and invite him, be with me. And we'll post that. Uh, so if you want to have a copy of that, you can get it. But I was also listening to a sermon by Daryl Johnson on this, and uh, I've adapted something that he talked about. I've changed it quite a bit, but I, I wanted you to be repeating after me because one of the things he talked about in his sermon was every church ought to be constantly inviting Jesus to be with us. Every church ought to be constantly asking the question, are we receiving Jesus? Are we open to him? Are we are really the things, the way we think, the way we do things, are we open to him? Or are we mainly settled on the way we like to do things on our terms? See, this prologue begins to really mess with your life. So I'll read a line, and then I'll make that gesture. And when I make that gesture, I'm just inviting you to repeat after me, Okay. So let's try this very quickly, and we'll be wrapping this up. As members of your family, we welcome you home, Lord Jesus. We are yours. We are made by you. We were made for you. We are incomplete without you. You made us a new creation. You invited us into your father's family. Come and make yourself home with us. Every room, every closet, every space in our lives is open to you. Rearrange the furniture of our life together in whatever way you want. May we be your dwelling place on earth as in heaven. My prayer is that would not just be something you'd recite with me, but my prayer is that be the way we think about who we are as a church always inviting him to draw closer to us, always eager to do whatever it is in our lives to allow the furniture to be rearranged so that he knows he really is at home with us and we are delighted in his presence. This morning, as we draw this reflection on the prologue of the Gospel of John, if you've not begun to follow Jesus, that's a decision you have to make. Will you receive him or reject him? The word has come. The light has come. The life has been offered. He who became flesh to dwell among us 
invites us to become the Father's children, and we become the Father's children, not by our own wills, but by receiving him into our life. Let's stand together as we sing. In need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me, in need of Christ, the perfect morning family. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I know you guys love me and so please be a little patient. We're running a little over it and I know you teachers are anxious to get to teaching uh, but we have some important things to uh, handle at this moment. First and foremost I would like to congratulate Bobby Hudson on his Academy Award as the innkeeper in the Christmas drama last Sunday. Thank you. Congratulations, Bobby. Love you. <laughs> Let's uh, also celebrate Rory Miller and Inez Jones on their baptism last Sunday. Yes, awesome. Awesome. Also, it's good to see Milton Jones in the back this morning. Good to see my brother. Yes. Like to give a special thanks and shout out to the Hermitage House Smorgas Board on their kindness uh, to our family. We really appreciate Tim and Leanne Prosser. Uh, we need to recognize that uh, Ginger Turner is in Summit Hospital. I know Ginger is such a loving person. Let's remember uh, Carol Powell, Board Parnell, Reba Hicks in the loss of her nephew, Ann and Cynthia Napier. Uh, let's remember Harmony Jackson and my beautiful sister. You might know her as Tracy Perkins, but I call her T. Perk. <laughs> and she says, I have allowed my grief over losing daddy to get in the way of being the wife, mom, friend, and Christian that I know I should be. I want to go into 2022 with an attitude of gratitude for the time I had with daddy and for the time I have left on this earth to make him proud. I want to be who God created me to be. And let me tell you, T. Perk, you are one of the most loving people that I know. And I know God will make that request and hear your prayer. Also, we received a letter from Francine Johnson, and it reads, It is hard to believe that December 11th marked the one-year anniversary of Jimmy's death. As wife, children, grandchildren, and other relatives, we are still processing our monumental loss. 
As we recap the past year, the family feels the need to express to you again how you carried us on angels' wings. We still remember the words of love, comfort, concern, and encouragement. We recall the food, card calls, monetary gifts, and donations to ministries and organizations in Jimmy's name. Moreover, when we reflect upon Jimmy's funeral service, Russ's endearing words of comfort, Steve's touching prayer, Anthony and the Madison Church singers, melodious voices, all of you gave us beautiful bouquets of homegoing memories for our loved one. Jimmy would be pleased to know that our dearly beloved Madison Church family surrounded us with love at the funeral by your attendance and by the continued care and concern you've showed, showered upon us until now. What amazing blessings God has rained on us through you. With love to you all from the family of the late Jimmy A. Johnson Sr., Francine Johnson, Sean, Jimmy Jr., Jonathan, Bradley, and Courtney. At this time, I would like to ask the elders, the deacons, the staff to stand in the aisles because going into 2022, we need to pray. And I want us to pray over this con congregation. So elders, if you would, just go stand and pick your aisle. Deacons, staff members, we're going to pray over this congregation right now because we need prayer, amen? I mean, we have a loving, you guys are so generous. We're going to celebrate these new marriages. We're celebrating the new births. I, you young people keep having these babies. I love it. That's right. We live in a free country. We have some victories, but yet we have to pray. This pandemic is resurging. We're suffering from violent crimes, school shootings. It's an amber alert going on every day. People are, our young people and people are struggling with gender identity, natural disasters, addictions. Our children are under attack, social unrest, political unrest, mass incarceration, greed and lust. We've got to pray. And if we repent, as Norm said, and turn from our wicked ways, God will heal this land. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Jehovah Jireh, you're our provider. Father God, I thank you and I give you praise, Father, for forgiveness. Father, I thank you for my beautiful wife of 38 years. She's my rock. Father, we as shepherds and deacons and staff, we pray over this congregation, your protection. Father, we pray that you will lead us and guide us into that light that Russ talked about. Father, we lift up Tracy, that she will submit to your will. We lift up Jimmy Johnson, Father, and Francine. Father, please forgive us when we have characteristics of greed of lust, of wanting our way, of indifference. Because, Father, you tell us in your word, in heaven will be people from all nations, all tribes, all languages, all peoples. And if we can't love here on earth, we're going to have a problem when we get to heaven. So let us love one another. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Thank you so much for Russ. Thank you for Anthony Lancaster, who is a kingdom man. I love him. Father, please be with our children, protect our children, seal our marriages. Father, let us be disciples of love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Here in America, we take a lot of things for granted, especially at Christmas. The resources we have all around us just aren't available in many parts of the world. We recently enjoyed a visit from Natasha, Sasha, and Regina Meluga, our Christian family, our missionaries in Ukraine. Unfortunately, since their return home, the pandemic has taken its toll. They are again a country in lockdown, and three ministers of the Ukraine Churches of Christ have lost their lives to COVID. All of this, along with so many political uncertainties, has left Ukraine in a very vulnerable position this Christmas. So now is a time to pray without ceasing for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We've specifically reached out to them and asked them, what can we do for them? And they very clearly, very simply state, Keep praying. South of the United States, the island of Cuba continues to be a focal point for our mission outreach. We were recently able to send some much-needed financial assistance to help ease the difficulties facing our brothers and sisters in Cuba. Roberto Pino heads up the church in Havana, and Luis Sori ministers to the church in Trinidad, Cuba. The funds were sent to Roberto to use as he saw need, and he was able to transfer $500 to the church in Trinidad. The response from Luis was overwhelming relief. The money was desperately needed. The timing was perfect. It's amazing what a modest $500 donation can do in a place like Cuba. And the best news, Roberto also reported several recent baptisms at the church in Havana. Just in time for Christmas, new brothers and sisters in Christ in Cuba because you care. Please continue to fervently pray for our Christian family here and abroad as we continually seek to share the gospel message and work to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to our community and to the world. This has been a Missions Minute. Merry Christmas. Just a quick heads up, next week is our first love offering of the new year. It'll be for benevolence, and uh, it'll be great. Uh, If y'all would, let's stand for our last song. I think you might know this one. One, two, ready to go. All night we're singing out. He got his angels watching over me. My Lord, we're singing And all day. Watching over me. Well, I went down to the valley to pray. Angels watching over me, my Lord. You know, my soul was so happy that I stayed all day. Take the Lord with you. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can Children sing.